If you have a home studio in your bedroom, your basement, or any other room in your home, chances are at some point you've struggled to get a full-bodied and upfront vocal recording that's comparable to commercial releases. The size of the room, the shape of the room, what's in the room, and even your microphone technique can have a severe impact on this. So today I want to talk about five steps that you can start putting into place to improve the vocal recording quality in your home or bedroom studio. So this is broken up into five steps and I'm gonna go over each of those with you. But also if you want a full in-depth guide that walks you through these steps and more in detail, you can download that entire guide for free and follow along as you start implementing these things into your home studio setup. Just go to from zero to studio.com slash vocals and you can download the full guide there. All right, so this is broken up into five steps. Step one is identifying and understanding your room. Step two is making use of acoustic treatment, even if you don't have acoustic treatment. And I'm gonna explain what that means in a moment here. Step three goes over your microphone technique and one of the biggest mistakes I see people make when recording vocals. Step four is all about why you should be recording multiple takes. Step five goes over some of the basic practices for comping and editing your vocal takes. So let's dive right into this with step one and that's identifying your room. So there are some things that are just simply out of our control such as the size, shape of our rooms, what's in the rooms, and all of this can affect our vocal recordings. Chances are your room isn't acoustically treated and you don't have an isolation booth available. So that means when you're recording your vocals, you're also recording everything being thrown back at your microphone from room reflections. By identifying how to make best use of your room and using some simple acoustic treatment, you can start to control your recording environment and the quality of your recordings. Our goal here is just to have a clear understanding of what we're working with and how to use it effectively. So imagine that every wall in your room is a mirror. Now, if you were to take a laser pointer and point it at the wall directly in front of you, it's gonna reflect right back at itself. Now, if you took that laser pointer and started moving it around, it's gonna create multiple reflection points in your room. So this is very similar to how your voice is gonna react when recording in an acoustically untreated space. Now, you're gonna have some items in your room already, such as a bed, a bookshelf, curtains hanging on your window, maybe you have a, an open exposed clothes rack with clothes hanging on it. All of these in some form are ways of treatment. If you've ever spoken in a completely empty bedroom before, you understand what a difference it can make to have some of these basic items in your room. While these do help to deaden up the room a little bit, we're gonna have to do a little more work to make this an optimal space for recording vocals. And that's gonna be by adding some acoustic treatment. Modern acoustic treatment looks nice and works great, but it can be very expensive. Even if you take the DIY approach, it can take a ton of time and materials to put this all together. So for the purpose of our acoustic treatment in this guide, we're gonna be using items that you already have in your home. To start, you can hang a moving blanket or a comforter from your bed and surround your immediate singing area with this. You can use mic stands, cymbal stands, hooks from the ceiling, rope and tape, anything really that will hold the weight of the blanket that you have available to you. I've even seen people build basic framing for this out of PVC piping that they bought at Lowe's or Home Depot or some other hardware store. So really just use whatever you have and whatever works for you. At minimum, you wanna to try to surround three sides of the microphone and above the microphone and sing outwards towards the larger area of the room. Most vocal mics have a cardio dipolar pattern, which means they only pick up sound from the front side of the microphone and they reject a large portion of the sound from the sides and rear. So the thick and plush comforter is gonna to help to absorb sound from behind you and from the sides of the mic, reducing short reflections. Singing outward into the larger part of the room is gonna allow your voice to dissipate into the room, reducing long reflections. For even better results, if you have a second blanket available, you could hang that to seal off the open side of your singing area. If you do decide to do this though, make sure you leave at least a couple feet of space between the back side of your microphone and the additional blanket. Just for an example, I set this up in a room that's used for a small office and storage. I used a moving blanket, an additional throw blanket, three boom mic stands, and a couple of weird clamps that look like sandals for some reason. Because of the existing items in this room, I could only set up in the center of the room, which means that my voice could only travel five feet before hitting the nearest wall and reflecting back at me. This room is square, it has very bare walls and a hardwood floor, so it is the extreme opposite of an optimal recording space. Now you might have a very similar situation in your room, but just try to get your back as close to one of the walls as you can and try to get some type of rug or carpeting underneath you. All right, so let's take a listen. I recorded a few examples with a condenser microphone so you can hear the room without any treatment and the room with the makeshift vocal booth. All right, so example one, this is the untreated room just talking a couple of feet away from the microphone. You can hear the echo of my voice when I'm a couple feet away from the mic. In example two, this is the untreated room, but talking about four to six inches away from the microphone. I'm talking loudly into a microphone. All right, so being closer to the mic is obviously better, but you can still hear a ton of room tone in that recording. Example three, this has the blanket treatment on three sides and above the mic, 
and I'm talking outwards towards a wall that's about five feet away. I'm talking loudly into a microphone. So this is a great improvement over the previous recording. I mean, there's still a little bit of room tone in there, but not enough that I would be super concerned about it or anything. You can still get great results with that. All right, well, let's go to example four. So in example four, I added a second blanket to completely close off my singing area on all four sides and the top. There's about two feet of space between the backside of my mic and the new blanket. I'm talking loudly into the microphone. All right, so you can hear that sounds much more isolated, more defined, and is the better of the example so far. So let's go to example five. I got one more for you. And this is the closed off area, just like the last example, but I moved the microphone so that the back of the mic is only a few inches away from the blanket. I'm talking loudly into a microphone. You can hear in that example how much that tone changed. It kind of just flattened everything out. There's no more life or character to it. So it just goes to show that you don't want to be singing directly at any surface, even if it is some form of treatment. So really quick, here are all the examples back to back. You can hear the echo in my voice when I'm a couple feet away from the mic. I'm talking loudly into a microphone. I'm talking loudly into a microphone. I'm talking loudly into the microphone. I'm talking loudly into a microphone. So I think we have a clear winner here, and that is example four. It's got minimal room tone, it has character, there's some life to the vocal, and it's just much more defined than the other recordings. So in that example, I had blankets surrounding all four sides and above the microphone on that. Once again, if you do surround your entire area, make sure you have a couple feet of space on either side of your microphone. At that, let's move into step three, and that is your microphone technique. I say this time and time again, but your microphone technique can make or break your vocal recordings. You can have the best microphone in the world, placed in the best room in the world, and it will not make a difference if you have poor technique. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make when recording vocals is having too much distance between themselves and the microphone. They wonder why their vocals don't sound as warm and rich as commercial recordings. And the bottom line is just that they're too far away from the mic. The closer you are to the mic, the fuller and warmer your vocal tone is going to be. As you start to back away from that mic a bit, you're going to start to pick up more room tone and the overall sound is going to be much thinner. Now, of course, you can use distance as a special effect or something like that. Maybe you want to change your tone on a certain part of a song. In general, staying about four to 12 inches from the microphone is a good guide. So if you've been standing a little further away from the microphone in the past and you're starting to make these adjustments, you might now be singing much closer to the mic than you have in the past. With that, you need to check your input level on your preamp, your interface. Um, if you're using a USB mic, you're gonna have to go into your audio settings on your computer and just make sure you're not clipping that signal at all. Even just moving up a few inches can really have an impact on that. So if you do notice any clipping, you're just gonna have to turn down that level a bit, test it out again, and get a happy balance where you're not clipping on the loudest parts of your song. You can always turn up your vocals inside of your recording software, but you cannot take out any digital clipping artifacts from a perfectly recorded take that you just finished. So that takes us to step four, which is multiple takes. So you as a vocalist or whoever you're recording, you might be a solid singer who can do a fantastic take start to finish on the entire song, and that's awesome, right? But the reality of it is, when recording, this doesn't always provide the best results, no matter how rehearsed you are. There are some truly great singers who can pull this off and do one single take for the recording. More often than not, you're gonna sacrifice certain areas of the song when attempting this. So the issue with recording the song front to back is that our brains have to focus on everything happening in that moment, everything happening after that moment, and it all has to be perfect. Combined with that, if you get to a spot where you make one small error, or maybe there was something that you really weren't happy with, that's gonna be on your mind for the remainder of that performance. Now, don't get me wrong. I always start a vocal session by having the singer sing through the full song two to three times, and we usually get some of the best raw emotion in some of them takes. And a lot of that stuff gets used in some of the final composition. No matter how great those initial takes were, we always go back to record more takes of individual sections to make sure they're perfect before moving on. So most often when you're recording the song front to back, the things that suffer most are your transitions going from verse to chorus, chorus to verse, and it might not be anything bad, but your mind is focused on finishing that verse, and then once you kick into that chorus, you're finally in gear for what's going on there. But there's that small little point going between the two that you know might not have been as good as it could have been, and this shows through in your final recording. So I highly recommend you record a smaller section, such as a verse, portion of a verse, and just take your time to really listen and focus on your overall tone, consistency, your timing, your pronunciation of everything. Maybe get three, four, five takes down, even more than that if you need to, um, and then you can go back and see what you really like the best. So after that, it takes us to step number five, which is comping and editing. So once you finish recording all your vocals, you got different takes going on, what do you do with them next? So now's the time to listen through everything and decide what you like best and what's gonna make the final vocal cut in your song. So comping is just basically removing a word or phrase from one take and replacing it with one from another take. A lot of recording softwares, your DAWs might even have a feature built in for this. I know in Cubase, like I do, you can actually just click with your mouse and highlight the sections that you want to hear in audition and it automatically puts them together into the final vocal for you. 
So overall, comping is a pretty painless process. You basically just sit and listen through all the different vocal parts you recorded and decide what you like best. So after you're finished with comping, we're gonna have to do some basic editing and clean up on these tracks. Uh, you're gonna have some dead space in parts, maybe between a chorus and a verse before a vocalist comes back in. Um, we're gonna wanna cut all that dead space out. Once you're done with all your comping, your editing, you have all these individual segments left over, and all of these are gonna have to either be cross-faded or faded in and out to eliminate any digital pops and clicks. Even with other instrument tracks playing, these pops and clicks will cut through your entire mix. So once your fades and crossfades are done, solo out that vocal into a final playthrough on this track. This is just gonna give you the chance to make sure it sounds like one continuous vocal all the way through. Nothing unnatural is happening. There's no pops and clicks from our editing points. I recommend to close your eyes during this playthrough or turn away from your computer screen completely. Oftentimes we will see an edit point or punching on our screen and our eyes will tell our ears to hear something there when really it's a smooth transition from one to the next. So make sure just give yourself an unbiased listen through, make sure there's nothing that needs to be adjusted. So that is it for the five steps to improving your vocals in your home or bedroom studio. Uh, there's also the full in-depth guide for this. So if you wanna download that, you can follow along as you start implementing this stuff into your own setup. So just go to from zero to studio.com slash vocals and you can download that entire guide there for free. If you're wanting to set up an easy and controlled recording space for your vocals, this guide is a must have because it covers a lot of information and there's a lot of stuff in that guide that goes even into more detail than I didn't cover in this video. So just download the guide and then you can actually reference it visually while you're trying to set up and fine tune your recording space. So my final call to action to you is to start taking steps to improve your recordings. You might not have the most ideal space, you might be recording out of your bedroom. These small changes can have a drastic impact on how your recordings will sound. So download that guide at fromzerotostudio.com slash vocals and start making improvements on how you're creating and capturing your music. So that's all for this video. Stay tuned for another video from me next week as we take you from zero to studio.